Good evening, everyone. This is the this is the third Friday, and it's the meeting of the Wilf San Jose branch of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And we start our meetings with the Raging Grannies. Okay, now the tune, sweet Betsy, you don't have to follow the tune if you're on mute. You can just Sing along and nobody will know the difference. So here, here we go. There are too many folks sleeping out in the street, clutching their bundles through the cold or the heat. No place to call home and no blankets or bed. They're lucky if some of them even get fed when wages are too low to pay the high rent and folks are left homeless, not even a tent. It's time for a change and on that we agree. More affordable housing is what we all need. In this prosperous country now, wouldn't you think we could house all the homeless as quick as a wink? If we weren't spending billions on weapons of war, we'd have affordable housing for all of the poor. In Santa Clara County, it's time to get down and to feed and to house all the poor in our town. We must fight against poverty, not against the poor, so that no one goes hungry or homeless no more. All right, the next one. Thank you. That one, I need to just tell you that the lyrics were by Vicki Ryder from the North Carolina tri Triangle Gaggle. And here we go, Rowan, I'm gonna mute myself and you do this. Okay. Close the wealth gap, close the wealth gap, do it now, do it now. We need living wages, we need living wages and safety nets and safety nets. Equal opportunity, equal opportunity is our cry, is our cry. Promote BIPOC and women, promote BIPOC and women. Break the glass ceiling, break the glass ceiling. 85 billionaires in Silicon Valley tax their wealth, tax their wealth. Just eight billionaires, just eight billionaires equals the wealth of the bottom half. Living wages, living wages, enough for all, enough for all. Affordable housing, affordable housing, enough for basic needs, enough for basic needs. Um, welcome, Dr. Armaline. He's the director of the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State and one of the authors of the annual Silicon Valley Pain Index, which has a collection of amazing statistics every year that emphasizes the wealth gap and the pain that is present, the poverty that is present in this, the richest county in California. And so it's an amazing snapshot every year. And I'm really sad that they left Twitter because I used to retweet them every day and that would give me lots of statistics. You know, I would I would feel like I was keeping up with things. But so um, he's promised to come and talk about the pain index and maybe give us some previews into the 2023. So you're on, sir. Hey, y'all, it's good to see you. It's nice to meet all of you. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, yeah, I. I I thought I would just talk a little bit about the background of the index and what we try to do with it um, and some of the issues that you might see coming out um, this summer when we release the new one. Um, so first of all, uh, the index started as an idea of my colleague, uh, Scott Myers Lipton, who's actually retiring after this year. He's done some really excellent work at the university for uh, over 30 years now, actually. Um, and so we'll miss him, but uh, he's going to remain sort of working with this project for the next few years. Um, and this is a project that he actually um, got the idea from uh, another one that was called the, the Hurricane Katrina Index. So after the hurricane in Louisiana back in 2006, uh, there was uh, uh, another social scientist who created an index to keep in the public eye the sort of ongoing humanitarian disaster that was going on there. And they used a 
similar method going from zero to whatever large number uh, in, in sort of index fashion to, to, to talk about some of those statistics. Um, but the, our other uh, sort of uh, impetus were some of the summer protests of 2020 uh, and Scott um, really wanted to, to do something there. And so we, we, we decided to, to launch the project. Um, the point of the project, though, is not really um, scholarship, to be honest. I mean, it is. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, it's more of a, a meta, a sort of a meta analysis, right? So in other words, we are pulling existing statistics from all over the place. And actually, this year, Scott worked with some of the folks at, at Venture Silicon Valley, uh, on their index uh, on some wealth uh, concentration stuff that we're actually going to share some additional analysis on in, in the summer. And I'll, I'll get to that here in a bit. But again, the, the point of the index actually is to spur uh, very real conversations about solutions and actual policy change and, and these sorts of things. It's not really to, to get into a sort of ivory tower conversation about our problems. Um, so the way that this tends to work for us uh, is that we'll do a, a press conference in the summer uh, after graduation. So things kind of calm down on campus and we have time to kind of be more community facing. Uh, and we'll put together a big press conference, invite speakers, uh, the whole thing, uh, invite some folks that are sort of put a face on some of the, the data that we, we put in the index, uh, folks who were impacted by, by many of the problems that we're trying to outline. Uh, and we're really just kind of putting a call out to the public and like, hey, Anyone who wants to get serious to work on these issues, let's talk and let's 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 work on these issues. And so it, we didn't really know how that would work, to be honest with you. Um, but it ended up working out really well. And and in fact, now every every year that we do it, we have multiple policymakers and also multiple uh, community organizations from around our area, but also elsewhere in the state that will reach out to us and say, "Hey, we're working on this too. What do you have?" You know, and then that starts sort of. Um, that network and power building that's really critical to uh, affect some change. So um, that's really the point of the index, if I can just kind of put it in real plain language. Um, but we do try very hard to put together some uh, um, both clear and useful and, and thoughtful uh, information for the public to consider uh, and, and try and give sort of paint a picture on how we're doing uh, in our region when it comes to these human rights standards. Now, the reason I said that, said that is because uh, we were part of an effort back in 2018 uh, where the county uh, declared itself as a human rights county. In other words, they symbolically, uh, you know, they sort of in a symbolic manner said that, you know, we, we are aligned with the sort of uh, principles of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and these are some of the principles that are going to guide our, our work here. So, you know, in our mind that doesn't really mean anything <laughs> if we're not actually going to keep track of that and like have an ongoing conversation about like whether or not those things are occurring in people's lives or not so that's the point of, of the whole thing and so uh like like you said we put it out every year um then we hope to get a, a good re response when it comes to sort of folks that want to engage in those issues after we we put the call out now this year uh we're going to add some components so this year, we have a pretty big team. Uh, we have several students and faculty and staff that we put together who are going to work on this this year, who are working on it right now, actually. And so we're going to have additional information on some of the major themes uh, that you can expect to see. So we'll have some stuff on criminal justice. Um, we'll have some stuff on uh, uh, wealth concentration and wealth inequality that's going to be really kind of the highlight, I, I think. Um, and you're going to see some other stuff on environmental uh, environmental impacts and environmental justice impacts. Um, and there's one more that's kind of in the air right now. I'm not sure if it's going to make it or not. So we'll see. But it'll be more than that sort of like Word document list that's like kind of really. And the reason we do that is because it's very press friendly. Uh, it's not like it's nice and shiny, but it's, it's very uh, friendly for uh, media call and for, um, you know, press release. So, but this time we're actually going to do a whole kind of like layout. Um, and so it'll also have some infographics and things like that. Cause we want to provide more uh, tools that organizations and folks can use on their own. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what we're shooting for, for the new one. Now that I have some really talented students and other folks besides my, this dummy, 
uh, trying to put uh, all those things together. So I'm, I'm really thankful to have uh, uh, Scott and, and have really a really wonderful team uh, to work together on on this work. Um, would you like me to say a little bit about the substance of it, like what we might be talking about? Okay, cool. You can also just tell me to shut up or ask me a question or whatever. This doesn't have to be super uh, formal. Um, but okay, so like I said, that they there we always try to have a, a theme to the index so that it's not just like a random scatter plot of information, right? Like that doesn't that's not very helpful, right? Like you need to kind of paint a picture and and have a, a narrative that makes sense over time as we're doing these year to year, right? So we're trying to sort of stick to these themes and coming back to some of those themes to see how we're progressing. Now you can imagine, and you can look at it on the on the website, uh, the 21 and 22 indexes, you know, have this focus on the impact of COVID uh, uh, and, and, and sort of the uh, issues that, that come, come out of that experience that we had as a community. And so uh, we're doing that again this year. And like I said before, this year, the focus is really going to be wealth concentration at the top uh, and wealth inequality in that sense. And um, this is some of the, the data that Scott worked on with, again, uh, Venture Silicon Valley uh, and some of their researchers uh, in, the, in like about six months ago to prep for their report. And we're going to do some additional uh, analysis that's ongoing now on some of that same data. But what I can tell you is not unlike uh, frankly, the statistics uh, in the world or in our our country, uh, wealth inequality is you know uh, impressive to say the least, uh, and the concentration at the top is immensely high. And when I mean um, concentration, I don't mean that the the one percent. I mean like the point oh oh one percent. I mean literally a handful of households that we can name and give addresses. Uh, you know, you don't even have to go to a statistic. We can like go to a, just list the names uh, that are holding as much wealth as a, a majority of our population in the region. So it's, and we're going to go in some more detail about what that concentration looks like uh, kind of down the chain a little bit and what it looks like at the top. And that's a, a level of detail that we really haven't had before. And it's uh, something that really, uh, you know, and I'll also say this as someone who's not from here, right? Uh, something that's very unique to this place, right? So um, many of us that grow up working class, uh, which, which I definitely did uh, elsewhere in the country, don't grow up in a place where the owning class is right there and their, man their sort of managerial class that's not you know, just un underneath them are also right there. Like, like in this region, you really are in the, the backyard in the seat of, of the, one of the most powerful blocks of capital uh, in the world uh, when it comes to these folks and their companies. You know, as a reminder, right, Apple's the first company to hit a uh, market cap of one trillion and then later two trillion. Now they've reduced from there. But uh, it's an, just an unreal level of uh, capital concentration in a region. Uh, so. We're going to get into that. And, and you know, it's um, something that really is um, not only sort of oddly dy dystopic, um, but it, it's it's really almost hard to, to give scale. So at the same time, we're leading the country in homeless youth. I mean, it, it, it's uh, really... Um, what I say to people, because we're about to start a podcast uh, from the HRI on a working class politics. So we're talking about like how, what we want to do and, and talk about there. And, and this is kind of one of the things that's come up, right, is this sort of uniqueness of the, this region in that sense where uh, this region in many ways is a microcosm of the sort of broader global dystopia that's, that's uh, been in formation for some time, um, where again, you have these massive homeless encampments you have the the you know really frankly kind of uh, uh, what do I want to say erosion of the the public erosion of public resource and public goods uh, not just pointing to like you know crappy roads and trash and things like that but our libraries our public schools are you know I, I could go on and on and on and on in terms of privatization and sort of loss of the public further loss of the public commons right um, and so at any rate. 
Uh, these are the, I don't want to drone on too long like a professor. At any rate, these are the kinds of things that we're going to sort of focus on uh, in this theme of, of the 23 index, right? Is this notion of extreme wealth concentration, what that looks like and what some of the impacts are. And I just, I, I, I'm going to be asking people to think about the kinds of things like I just said, because I can tell you folks from other places like have not, well, it's slowly being normalized because of the, what's being done in terms of housing costs across the country, because that's a, uh, sort of network of capitalists and landowners that are doing that, not just here, but elsewhere. Uh, but besides that, this is still a pretty unique place for people. And when they come here, it's just kind of, it's just kind of shocking, right? Um, at any rate, uh, that's one of the things, as I said before, we're also going to be focusing on environmental issues. Uh, one of the things that uh, people responded to more than we thought actually in the last uh, index was um talking about things like uh, even uh, sort of the amount of trees that are in uh, areas of, of, of San Jose versus the amount of pavement and these sorts of things and how that impacts uh, health and also just the straight up like temperature, right? just the weather conditions and the impact of heat and, and climate change and, and everything else. And so um, that's something else that we're expanding on in, in 2023 is to look at some of these um, environmental issues and the environmental impacts of, of some of these uh, other inequities and structural phenomena. Uh, and then uh, as we always do at the HRI, because we're deeply engaged in these issues, and I should say, uh, I'm also the criminal justice chair for NAACP, uh, and I'm working with Reverend Moore Slate now that he's back. Uh, and we are very busy on the criminal justice front for any of you that have been watching the news uh so we'll be talking about some of those issues as well uh and and these relate to national issues uh i i apologize i don't want to be uh, uh profane but uh if you've been paying attention to the national news you will have seen some absolutely horrific deaths in our county jail systems particularly in the south but not just in the south we're also talking rikers island and all kinds of other places including a, a, a mentally ill man who was eaten alive by insects. Uh, you know, these are, de you know, internationally deplorable kinds of uh, uh, conditions. And so um, uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about, uh, because our jail conditions have also been a matter of concern in national media as well. Uh, no one's been eaten alive by insects, thank God. But, uh, you know, we, we have our own versions. Um, so we're going to be talking about those issues and, and maybe a, a little bit about how they connect to broader sort of national phenomenon uh, that we see across the country. Um, we've also been at the NAACP working with issues on the sheriff and some of these other issues. So, so some of these things uh, sort of intersect as they should, because, again, we're not doing this for scholarship. We want, want this information to matter. Um, so we're going to be looking at that as well. We'll have some information on that. Uh, and then, sorry, what was last? Oh, housing. That was the last thing I, I, I didn't mention. And this was also an issue uh, that we focused on in our 2022 index. Uh, housing remains uh, an issue. And it's, it's um, uh, if you'll allow me to be a scholar for a minute, um, I don't find that the analysis uh, that we get uh, in the region in terms of uh, our media is, is doing a terribly great job uh, in talking about this issue. I mean, this is an issue of, of capital. Um, this is an issue where you have uh, the, the sort of simultaneous calls or desires for uh, housing to be a human right, you know, something that everybody in the community would have and get access to and in any number of ways, whether that's through social housing or a livable wage or, or whatever it happens, you know, reduce housing costs, whatever it happens to be, uh, or uh, uh, housing is a speculative asset. And it's operating as a speculative asset. And the thing is, is like, if you ask a lot of us uh, who are, you know, political sociologists and, and sort of left economists or whatever, we'll tell you that you can't have both at the same time, particularly at this time in the global economy. So um, where capital is, is really looking for places they can get a return on not just the dollar, but whatever currency that they are absolutely cash flush with. And this is not just folks in the United States. This is Chinese capital. This is, this is all, all over the world, right? And things like California real estate are things they can buy and things they can get a really, at least up until recently, a very predictable return. And so that's what 
uh, keeps that bubble inflated, even though you'll drive by those glass towers downtown and only like half the lights are on, right? And a lot of these 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 properties are also being flipped into rental properties to keep the the rent rates uh, elevated as well as a sort of networked activity across the country using algorithm and all the wonderful tools our tech companies are giving them. So, you know, this really is an issue of capital and we're going to talk about it as such. This really isn't an issue that's as simple as like, well, we just make need to make it easier for these developers to build housing. I mean, that's kind of part of it, I guess, but the developers are part of the problem because they run the show, right? And their interests are capital interests, not, again, making housing a human right. Uh, their, their interest is to make money by definition. So um, this is the way that I insist on talking about housing, which is perhaps why I don't get invited to do talks on housing anymore after I started saying these things in front of developers. Uh, but but we always focus on it. And in fact, our human rights, I'll plug our lecture, our human rights lecture this year, uh, which will be, oh shoot, of course I forget the date. I'll grab it before we, we run here. Uh, it'll be coming up at the end of May, uh, is actually going to focus on social housing and the housing issue in our region. We have three wonderful women experts that are going to be speaking on the issue. It's free for everybody. It's via Zoom. And so we're trying to, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's uh, well, you know, I don't, you know, I try hard, you know, especially when, when I'm out in public, not to uh, get too flowery with my language about it because or too aggressive. I used to, you know, but it's because I think it's actually just simpler than that. You know, like it's, it's actually like really kind of plain as day. You can't, you can't have these properties be a, a chip in a global poker game because that's essentially what they are. Uh, and say, we're also going to make it so that everybody that lives here is going to be able to live there. It's just not, I mean, I can just ask you like, how's that working out? I mean, all the market solutions have been tried <laughs> over and over and over again. Two billion worth, if you count the city and the and the and the county, right? Nine hundred million each. So, right, this is the way that I tend to talk about it, and we will talk about it, and we'll have some new information uh, along the lines of housing and some of our housing spending and, and some of that stuff. Um, and like I said, we'll have our human rights lecture that's going to uh, touch on housing as well. Uh, and with that, uh, oh, and I'll say one more thing too. We obviously, as always, if you notice in the previous indexes, we focus on issues of, of gendered inequality and racial inequality and the, these, these uh, aspects through all of these issue areas. So you're also going to see things about like diversity at the top. You're going to see things about our dwindling African-American community, particularly African-American working class community. Just, you know, so these, these are other, uh, I would call them through lines. Like instead of the like separate issue areas, these are going to be the through lines of the report that you'll see reflected across across the board. And uh, I don't really think I need to tell you what those look like. Uh, I think everyone with a set of eyes uh, in our community can see what that looks like. Um, and so we'll have some new numbers on that. Uh, I want to stop here because I've already run my mouth more than I had intended. Because uh, I'd really rather be able to answer some of your questions about any of these issues or or, or anything that I can offer since it's your time this evening. I have a I have a question. You said, I think I heard you say that you want to focus on solutions for some of these things. So how do we do that? How do we engage people? I mean, we're women of a certain age and we can do some things and then some other things we can't do. But you know, how do you engage communities? Some of us are involved all over. The, how how do we engage with this? Uh, how do it, we? Our, I, I can say how we do it. It's not the only ways, to, right? There's all kinds of ways to do these things. I don't want to claim to have all those answers. I can just tell you what we've done, right? So like I said, when we put the index out, we put out an open call, right? Uh, with that press release, like anyone that wants to talk to us about these issues, we'll do what I'm doing right now, right? We'll come give talks. We'll, we'll uh, help make sense of the information for folks, all that and folks that want to start working on policy, because we also do that, we write policy, we do policy reform. Uh, we get into those conversations as well, whether it's with policymakers or with organizations that would like to approach policymakers that we work with. Uh, now, when I say, you know, take that lightly, when I say policymakers that we work with, it's like, they're politicians, we're not politicians. Uh, 
<laughs> right? We have to navigate the same kinds of nonsense that everyone else has to navigate, right? So we're very upfront about that, but you know, we're here to get things done. So we do what we need to do. Um, and, but yeah, so that, that's, that's kind of how it happens now, uh, in terms of engagement. So we've worked really hard over many years to establish relationships with all kinds of community organizations and communities, uh, uh straight up, um, uh, or at least we try our best. Uh, and so we depend on that coalition building to actually move the ball. Right. So, uh, let's say we put out the index, right. And you all contact us and uh, sacred heart contacts us and another coalition like pact contacts us and all kinds of right. And these are all our friends and we know each other and right. The left is a relatively small world here. And so, uh, they'll say, Hey, we, we really want to, we want to make moves on this, right. We're, we're concerned about this. You really laid out great information. I think we can take this to such and such. And these are some of the goals that we want to build on. We'll have that conversation. Right. And from there, it's strategic, right? So from there, it's about, okay, here's our goals. What are our strategies going to be? And we try and handle that in coalition. And in that space, we try and be good role players, right? So we have some, well, we have some ethical lines that we don't cross that I think are fairly obvious. Uh, and we also have some sort of like rules that we have to follow so that we don't get in trouble as a public institution. So um we have to take, for example, any more that lobbying line very seriously. So like, I don't do lobbying anymore. Um, we, we work around that in some other ways. Uh, but if a policymaker reaches out to us, that's fine. Right. So, so, you know, we also have to be role players, but, you know, often if those other things need to be done, uh, our other organizational partners that, that have that freedom, you know, they, they, they hop to it, you know, they, they're, they're really good folks. So uh, we count on each other. Right. And so we've, and we worked with some, some, so Wendy, I see you in the room, right? Like we at NAACP, we've worked with Wendy on, on, on several issues. So we try and, uh, just keep those connections alive and, and work with each other as best we can. So I had another question. If nobody has, I got lots of questions. Another question in um, a, a book I read recently about work, pray and code or something like that. I don't remember quite the name of it, they talked about the commons and how in Silicon Valley, the commons are really being taken over by companies. And one thing I hadn't thought about was the buses. You know, the bus, bus systems used to be part of the commons, used to be part of every, we, anybody could get on the bus. Well, now, we have these corporate buses and they show up in my neighborhood. They show up, they use public bus stops. The people park in private and they park in a church parking lot where I am. A church parking lot, I guess, has given them permission, to, the riders permission to park there. So it's troubling to me that the companies have taken this step to kind of usurp the commons. Uh, you know, uh... I obviously agree with you um, in the, I, you know, if you'd like, I can get into why they're doing it. I mean, it's, it's a, it has to do with the thrust of corporate capital in general. It's what they must do, uh, even if they didn't want to. Uh, and that's why when I was, you know, really trying to push folks uh, and I did, I, I was invited to these talks, these community level talks. Uh, by working partnerships and others, and 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 they're wonderful. Is that but, but this is kind of how it went down uh, with the Google expansion, right? So we're about to have a massive privatization of the public commons uh, in direct and in, in indirect terms, right? And directly in the sense we're literally just giving them a bunch of land, <laughs> and 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 indirectly in the sense that all all that tech money is going to rush in here. Uh, and and continue to just hammer the rest of us that are that don't that aren't part of the asset class and are just struggling to live, just struggling to make either rent or mortgage. Uh, so you know, um, and coming back to that, by the way, I realized I didn't say something earlier that I was going to say. There's another impact on our housing uh, as a result of these uh, uh, interest rate increases, and the reason that's super important is because what that does that 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 doesn't make hard for hard for everybody to buy property just like buying cars, right? That only hurts people that have to finance. Big capital like BlackRock or Blackstone who handles their real estate, uh, they don't need finance. 
they're buying cash. So while everybody else, all just normal folks are nixed out of the market and unable to put bids on homes because, you know, you're going to now pay so much more in a monthly payment because you're paying 6% interest before, you know, it was before it's two or whatever. Um, you know, you're priced out of that home, but those big corporate interests, they can buy everything up. And so Google essentially is doing the same thing <laughs> with this, this Google expansion. And when I was in these, some of these community conversations, you know, one thing that I really pushed for was like, hey, you know, you guys are asking for things that they're going to have to do anyway. Like get what well, give service jobs. They're going to have to do that anyway. Right. And they're still not going to pay you enough. That you can actually continue to live here, buy a home here. So why aren't we asking for actual public capital, shared capital, land, housing, all of it? You're giving them that, give that in the neighborhoods too, yeah. so that they have capital that's going to increase in value, capital that they can use, they don't have to pay rents on, right, et cetera, et cetera. See, but no one was thinking in, in, in terms of the sources of power in our region. They were just thinking of like, what are the little asks we could get? But that, that doesn't impact in the long run things like the cost of housing or the ability of people to find places to live even outside that market. So anyway, I don't want to keep yapping on. You've had your hand up, Donna. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No, that, that's, that's fine. It's really important, all the feedback you're giving us. So you're, you're awesome. Um, my question is, um, do you have, um, do you translate the index into other languages? that it's not just in English, but it's available in other languages? Yeah, we're going to be looking into that. We have uh, a couple folks lined up, so they might be able to do it. We've done some of that before in terms of Spanish translation, um, but uh, it's something that we're talking about now. We, we, we just honestly haven't lined it up yet because we still have some time. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're, we're going to try and make it as uh, uh easily disseminated as possible uh it's just it's kind of challenging right because it's such a statistical index and it gets in a technical language so a lot of the folks that we would normally have um translate it's just it's not conversational right so the, the translation is actually really difficult um so th that's kind of the challenge is, is is actually finding you know not just someone that's like really great and fluent in vietnamese for example but someone that can actually write in technical language in right it's, it's a totally different scene yeah. uh same with me it's, i mean same with my language right like if you asked me to go technical in my any my, your foreign language stuff I, i'd be lost on that I, it's because there's so many communities in this area right not, and not just not just people who speak espanol of but, course right of people course. who speak tagalog people who speak different dialects and in, in um of Chinese languages, um, and I I think um, <clears throat> it would impact you know if if it's possible to find people to do that kind of translation, it would really empower these communities to come out and and really participate. So, but it that is very difficult. Yeah, it becomes a resources issue. But again, we're we're working on it. Okay. Sorry, I'm not living in Silicon Valley. I used to live in, and I see the stark differences of groups like ultra rich houses, mansions, and then there's the people on the street and some living in cars. Yeah, I saw that. I see it in San Diego also, but not as much as in Silicon Valley. There's a real, and the middle class are being squished. The middle class are no longer available. There's no middle class. It's either the poorest and the richest. And something has to be done. I mean, building luxury apartments, oh, we're building them, but none can go live in it. They can't afford to live in it. Or prices of everything, food going up, electric going up. And I'm in city, I went to city hall last few weeks about my bill on TV. I was on TV. <laughs> as a person who's suffering from electric bills for one bedroom. And uh, yeah, there are many things uh, that are the uh, middle class, they can't afford to send the um, kids to university, it used to 10,000, now I don't know, it's 50,000, some ridiculous. Everywhere we are being squeezed. Why can't we have free education, little health, health and all these 
then maybe we will have a little relief in the other things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. If we get some relief through other, like other countries, they have, my family lives in France, they never complain of it headache or surgery or anything here. Everybody has to do surgery, go to doctor. The whole Medicare system is a mess. I mean, Medicare is paying right and left to everybody without asking them. Everybody, they like an ice pack for $30 in the hospital. It's just nobody's there to monitor all these. Yeah, there's somebody, our politicians, we need better politicians. <laughs> Uh, I, I agree. Um, I think the key there, at least what we write about and I write about is, um, I, mean, I, don't mean, I don't like throwing around cliches, but sort of getting, around, getting money out of politics, so to speak, but it's a little more complicated than it's mm -hmm. talked about. The lobby community. And the, I mean, that's because that's the source of the problems that you're talking about, essentially. It's, you know, the, the United States... Um, you know, is skittish around sort of languages of socialism and things like that. However, when you speak directly about the the, the various um, social benefits, people are all for them. Like that's why the, the even the right is terrified to touch social security and these sorts of things. They want to so badly. I mean, it's the it's the last prize that they get to privatize, right? And put into there's another poker chip in the market that they can inflate. Um, and and take it out on all, you know all of our, our older folks with with fixed incomes. Um, they are privatizing it though. Oh yeah, they are already working at it. You know what I'm saying? But they they still have some fear about the, about that that's, that's real. Um, but I you know I I, I agree with you, Essie. I, I obviously uh, think that things could be very different. We could have a very different distribution of resources that would make this place uh, a more livable. Uh, health, for a lot of folks health, better university access i mean our kids are can't afford it. well it's, uh, something i wanted to mention that you you said uh, is you're correct that this is also very generational mm -hmm. and I, I personally am on the cusp right but um you know so first of all let me say i'm not one of these folks that's like uh constantly um I don't know, su suspect of Gen Z and millennials or like young folks or whatever. I, my, as a teacher, you know, my experience is uh, these young folks are amazing. Like they are impressive and they face problems that make all of our problems that we faced, even the so-called greatest generation, including my grandfather, mm -hmm. look like nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and those are the kinds of issues I'm writing about in my book that the, the things that we're actually facing right now and I wish it was as simple as, you know, minor geo, well, major geopolitical issues, but this climate change uh, variable just throws a wrench in everything, it's you know, and libraries and attacking the post office. Well, so what I was going to say is that they, they, that generation, so the Gen Z folks, there was just actually work on this today. I was listening to this morning. So that gen, gen Z folks are becoming very much aware that they're going to have a very different future than their parents and grandparents. And they are very unhappy about that. Yeah, kind of so I have some faith that there is a political reckoning coming. I just hope it's the good kind and not the ugly kind. Because once those folks are in their 30, like 35 range to 40 range, and they still can't buy a house, they still can't have a kid, they still see no future. I mean, yeah, no uh, best of luck to everybody dealing with that. So uh, it is very much generational and they're very aware of it. They're like, we're not going to just like have a kid and buy a house like you all did. That That's like totally off the plate for us. Yeah. It's either you got mommy and daddy money or it ain't happening. So I want to just recognize Rowan who has her hand up. Rowan? I thought I would ask, you know, you, I know you're preparing the 2023 uh pain index and I was wondering if there were any statistics that surprised you in the coming year or or that are significantly different than the things that you've seen before I just you know tell us more yeah so I promised Scott I wouldn't share actual stats so that's the only that's one thing I can't do but I can tell you sort of what they reflect so um again the level of wealth concentration is extremely high 
just i mean off the charts high all right that's all i i mean again once you get in the point where it actually becomes qualitative data instead of quantitative data or you're saying these people who live here which we're not going to do that to folks and get sued but it uh, uh that that's where it, it's uh it's impressed again like the word i can find is impressive um also uh, there are some aspects uh that that i find personally uh, you know sociolo sociologically very interesting about the um lack of working class black folks all over and it speaks to um well, it speaks to lots of things, but it, it speaks to the way that we think about and deal with racism, uh, completely absent of capitalism, which is insane. Uh, and we we mistake uh, uh, essentially new newly minted members of elites of, of color as like we're diverse. Uh, and, and frankly, um, I question that kind of like shallow identity politics. I, I don't, I don't find that to be terribly useful. Uh, and again, it's another one of those things where I'd ask like, how's that working? Right? Like how, how many working class black neighborhoods can you name? And I see, I see Donna. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and not to speak in segregated terms, but let's be real about what that would be. So, um, you know, that some of those aspects are, are uh, I, I think, very interesting. And Donna, I see your hand. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, so um, this is the first time I've, I've heard um, about the, the index. So I don't know what, um, what information and statistics stuff you've had in the past, but you can I'm interested. Check it out on the link. You can, you can actually get both of the previous indexes from that link if you want. Yeah. So my question is this, that I noticed that in most places, almost everywhere I go, I almost do not see people with vis visible handicaps working. And I'm wondering if that, if you've ever covered that, because there's plenty I mean, there are lots and lots and lots of very capable people with handicaps who can't get hired. And um, I've started seeing some like working, bagging at Safeway and, and things like that, but that's ridiculous. So I wonder if you've ever, ever um, done that because of then of course, you know, people, um, Black people and other people of color are going to be lower down on the totem pole of getting hired as a disabled um, person with with a physical with a visible physical disability. And so, um, the ADA was passed what in the seventies, so that it shouldn't be what it is now, right? We should see lots and lots and lots of of people working, and that you know almost every everywhere you go. A person in a wheelchair can't go visit people in their houses because they can't get in the front door or the back door because there are steps and it, a wheelchair can't jump up. And so it's, I, and I'm positive there's plenty of buildings that say they're, they're accessible, but for some people with some disabilities, they're not accessible, right? In many places, maybe they have an accessible entrance, but there's no accessible bathroom. So if there's not an accessible bathroom, so what you can get in the front door, right? I've understood from a friend of mine, um, the new buses, it's incredibly difficult to get on uh, on the bus in a wheelchair because the, the incline is steep and the turn to get into the bus, and then there's not enough room to turn around once you get into the bus. So all this kinds of stuff. So I, um, if, if your index hasn't, that pain index, the pain index hasn't covered any of this, I highly suggest in 2024, you, you cover it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I mean, I, I know we've covered uh, some stuff, but it hasn't been a theme, right? So um, I, I, I can take it back to the team and see, see if what we can dig up. It's a, you know, one of the difficult things is the existence of the data itself, right? So sometimes we'll have a question that we're like, oh, man, we want to 
address this issue. We won't, we, you know, we'd really like to present something on this. Uh, and sometimes we just can't find the data on it. You know, it just is, it doesn't exist or it'll exist, but not regionally. Right. So the, the, the index is a regional index, right? So we might have national data on that, for example, but no one's had the time or the resources to actually collect it locally. So sometimes uh, what the index tells us is kind of like what still needs to be done. But uh, it strikes me that there should be some stuff that, you know, it, it starts to get more complicated when uh, you start getting into questions about visible versus invisible. So a lot of the corporations here, uh, uh, well, some of their statistics uh, on those numbers would have to do in part with the number of sort of folks, folks on the spectrum that tend to be in the tech industry. Right. And so one of the things those companies can do is they can say, look at what a great employer we are. We employ all these folks, right, that, that have a, a, a disability uh, or, or who are special needs in, in these ways. And, you know, it's part of the sort of like corporate woke stuff. So, um, you so know, it, it have, sometimes- I, like, oh, Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Go ahead. I was just going to say uh, uh, Donna's uh, example of, of buildings you can get in the front door, but there's no bathroom. That would include 70 West Heading, our county building. As a person in a wheelchair, I only do city work. I don't do county work because there is no bathroom that is accessible in the public areas. And so as a wheelchair user, if I want to go talk to my supervisor, I have to find a guard. They're all male. They have to escort me downstairs to the public to the private area. They have to wait while I do my business. And then they have to escort me out. And so I stop at the Togos across the street and buy some chips on my way in. So at least I start empty, you know, but it, I mean, we're not just talking about people's houses or about all the new developments that are coming up. They were putting in a senior development near me and it has steps. And I'm like, hello, uh, have you even thought about the people who are going to be living here and what their needs might be? And so, uh, yeah, sorry, I just had to had to, you know, jump in on that one. <laughs> and and I, I don't know if any of you all know Molly, uh, who's been an advocate in the community for a while. In the spirit, well. just, right. So, yeah. uh, you know, I've sat on many, many uh many, many uh, commissions with Molly. And so she, she informs me, you know, I, I'm very thankful for it, uh, of all these issues. So like I said, um, um, I, I'll, I'm happy to take it back to the team and see if there, maybe there's something we can put together on some of that stuff. So I, I, I have another question where I think I got in your presentation that there are three areas that this is going to, that the 2023 is going to focus on. One is housing, which you called an issue of capital. One is environmental justice. And the other is the, let's see, what did you call it? Extreme income inequality? Well, something, I don't know what you call it. But wealth, wealth inequality. Wealth inequality. Yes, the difference between wealth and income. Yes, I got it. And so, but in terms of, it's one thing to know and it's another thing to turn that into action. And so once we know, like once we know about the statistics around environmental justice issues that you're promised, Scott, you wouldn't tell us about, but you know, they're they're coming. You know, what can we do? How do we, how do we, how do we who tend to be um women who aren't used well, we're sitting on Zoom meetings right now, but we used to be really active. <laughs> Some of us still are, but how? what do we do? Environmental justice issues. Well, like I said, it really depends on the goal and the strategies. I, I, I can't give a, I really can't give a sort of overarching answer to your question, unfortunately. I wish it were that simple. Um, you know, you have to think really hard about the issue that you want to impact and how you you want and think you can and what it requires to do so and then you have to build the sort of the networks and the the whatever sources of power you're going to implement to get it done um i would suggest that you have some of that right like uh um your broader network of uh, of folks that live in the area uh are I, I would imagine some of whom are part of that asset class and 
all of your constituents and, and you know, particular folks uh, uh, arenas, right, whether it's Congress or, or local. And so you can start engaging with those folks on solutions and start making some demands. Now, you're going to have to expand a bit unless there's a lot more of you than I think. Uh, so that probably means partnering with some other folks that can broaden your numbers. And, but, you know, it's, it, it, I, I want to make it clear, like, it's not rocket science. Like a lot of this stuff really isn't. It's, but you do have to have enough people and resource to make, uh, either, either push some policies forward or make some demands on folks. Um, that, I mean, again, like, that's, our, that's our experience. Uh, it, but, I, I mean, it is hard. Right. Like I'm saying it's not rocket science in the sense is like it doesn't take a P like you don't need a PhD uh, to be doing any of this stuff. You just need to be a stakeholder with with enough like guts and brains to do something. Uh, so uh, I just encourage everyone to think about that. And all of us have like things we have to offer and things we don't have to offer. Right. I mean, everybody has something to offer and everyone has to think really humbly about what that is. I know the things that I'm really bad at, right? So I don't do those things. I let other people do those things, right? So um, I don't know. Hopefully that's a reasonable answer. I, I don't know. I'm trying to give you something satisfying. Is it, and, and I saw Essie's hand and then I have another question. So Essie? Sure. Uh, just to let you know, y'all, I do have to run in five. I, I have to I get another call at eight o'clock. Okay. Essie? I'll be very quick. We can start this environment issue with a small basic stuff. Like my um, manager says, from now on, you have to not put plastic in the trash, don't put this in the recycle, but they only give us a blue container and a green container. Where's the other container for plastic? And plastic should be not allowed. Your restaurants give you plastic, everybody's playing with plastic. The production side problem it's it's not going to be solved on the consumption side i mean I, like i remind my students like and i don't mean this in any kind of way and i know there's some flaw in this logic but i i give it as an as an example right so you know when we're taking our bags to target or whatever so we're not taking the plastic bags well you know they've already made the bags they're going to bake and use the bags whether you were going to take it or not and it's still going to go to the same place whether you were going to use it or not yeah, the whole system should be it's a production side problem mm -hmm. right you're not you're not going to fight it with your dollar right like that's or with your own like personal consumption habits like that's that's really a message that that corporations were very active in putting out because it actually helps them yes. just yeah. makes a new market out of you there was a plastic tell you now they're just going to sell you the whole foods bag so <laughs> I, have a, I have a question about philanthropy sure has philanthropy some of these people the what that's just kidding it's a joke philanthropy some of these people who are in our silicon valley area are either quiet or quite visible philanthropists how much does that if how much does that have an impact on this pain index is that making any difference to take this extreme wealth and parse it out to their liking well i have to well i have to be careful how i answer here so uh one of the guests that we're going to have at, at the lecture is uh someone who works for the chan zuckerberg initiative so i you know there are some good people that are working in some of these arenas like i i don't you know what i'm saying it's kind of big structural comments it, it, there's nuance to all of that right um but give that nuance aside um philanthropy is preferred by the owning class precisely for the reason you said because they control it all and that's all that it's about it, it's it's if you ask to tax them for that same amount of money they will fight you tooth and nail and that's all you need to know. Philanthropy, they get to look like heroes, act like heroes, get invited to banquets and balls. They get to write it off all their taxes. And they get to do what they want to do. And in the cases of folks like Gates, and I don't mean like these goofy conspiracy theory nonsense, 
uh, I just mean like very real, obvious uh, political, political economic interest. You know, they they give in a way that promote the visions of a society that they believe in. And uh, I don't know, I would encourage you to do some readings on what some of our billionaire class thinks about the future of our society. It is not what I would imagine is a very wonderful place. So, you know, I, I, I will I always prefer taxation and wealth redistribution publicly over, mm-hmm. you know, their generosity. And I'm very aware of the time, but before you leave, I want all of us to appreciate your your presence. Oh, Thank you very much, your presentation. <laughs> and it since Rowan did record it, what are the plans for the recording, Rowan? What happens to that? Well, like I said, I probably won't do it this weekend because I'm in Sacramento at the ACLU this weekend. Um, and I'll, I'll be back Monday night, but it should be on our YouTube channel, the Wolf San Jose YouTube channel by Wednesday. Um, okay. But I just want to, everybody, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Armley. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much, much for all your work, man. Thanks. It's good to see you. Yes. And, uh, you know, Donna and Wendy and everybody that I've gotten to work with before, it's good to see you all. It's nice to meet the rest of you. I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Good night. And a big thank you to Rowan, who arranged this meeting. Well, thank you. I was just so, so, so sad when they left Twitter. I mean, I get, you know, a lot of leftists left Twitter, but they were doing a statistic a day for the last year on their Twitter feed. And so every day I was able to share something about the inequality in our region. And I just really valued that. So, yeah. I have to go as well. well thank I, you for coming. It was, it was a very informative evening. So thank you for organizing this. I appreciate it. Bye. Nice to see you. And, see you. and Donna, looks like you're leaving too, Donna. You're waving anyway. Nice to see you. <laughs> well, how, how much longer will the meeting go? Uh, just a couple of songs. You know us. The third Friday, because that's our regular WILF meeting, and we have kept up that pattern through COVID and high water. COVID is equal to hell, right? COVID and high water. So we have kept it up. So we're going to have our songs. I think I think Rowan is singing both of our, our oh. well, songs. I'll, I'll sing the first one, but if somebody wants to do uh, When We Make Peace, I'm totally down with having somebody else do it. I wanted to sing this. It's a poor people's campaign song, but it talks about, you know, a lot of the issues that the pain index will talk about. And it's another Vicki Ryder from the Triangle branch in North Carolina. There's something that's troubling the grannies. So we toss and we turn late at night, wondering why there are so many hungry in a land that's so rich that ain't right. It's time for a moral revival, so we join the poor people's campaign to end poverty in our nation. We've joined the poor people's campaign. The government spends all our taxes for killing in wars far away. But we grannies say give our kids books, not bombs, and give the kids teachers fair pay. It's time for a moral revival, so we've joined the poor people's campaign. To end senseless wars across the planet, we've joined the poor people's campaign. They're drilling and fracking and dumping to fatten their wallets, you see. And they don't really care if we live or die, it's enough to make Mother Earth weep. Now it's time for a moral revival, so we've joined the poor people's campaign to stop them from poisoning our planet. We've joined the poor people's campaign. 
equality for all the people they say is the law of the land but our system is blatantly racist so together for justice we'll stand it's time for a moral revival so we've joined the poor people's campaign and together we'll pick up the torch and work for the national poor people's campaign we're not afraid of their handcuffs they can lock us in jail if they must but we Japanese won't sit by in silence while they throw us all under the bus it's time for a moral revival so we've joined the poor people's campaign and we're glad all you folks have joined with us in the national poor people's campaign in the national poor people's campaign all right well this is our traditional closing song with verses just for this event when we make peace instead of war when we make peace instead of war how i want to be in that number when we make peace instead of war when tech billionaires see pain of the poor when tech billionaires see pain of the poor how i want to be in that number when tech billionaires see pain of the poor when rich and poor have equity when rich and poor have equity how i want to be in that number when rich and poor have equity when Silicon Valley has homes for all, when Silicon Valley has homes for all, how I want to be in that number, when Silicon Valley has homes for all, when we make peace instead of war, when we make peace instead of war, how I want to be in that number when we make peace instead of war thank you everybody for coming this has been the third friday wilf meeting and we're here every month with grannies and some topic relating to peace justice anti-racism whatever uh, we can find somebody to talk to us about. So if you have any ideas, our coordinating committee would love to hear about people that could come speak to us because we don't have anybody lined up for next month yet. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.